one is now in session. Thank you. You may be seated. Good morning. We're here today in our case number CACR 140521, State versus Dickinson. Uh, we, we sent out a, an order uh, directing the parties to prepare to answer uh, one question. Uh, we didn't mean to exclude, exclude you from making whatever argument you might want to make regarding, for example, the uh, waiver, uh, whether, whether defense counsel waived the request uh, to not have a mistrial. Uh, before we, we get into argument, as you know, these proceedings are recorded, uh, both audio and visually. Uh, so we'd ask you to identify yourself and your client uh, the first time you approach the podium. Uh, each side will have 20 minutes. Appellant's counsel, if you'd like to reserve time for rebuttal, that'll be up to you. Uh, we have conference this matter. We think we're familiar with the facts, uh, but we're interested in in any nuances you might be able to provide. Uh, with that, uh, appellant, you may proceed. May it please the court, my name is Jared Keenan. I represent Cole Dick uh, Wade Dickinson, uh, the appellant in this matter. In addressing the issue raised by this court, Mr. Dickinson's second trial resulted in a double jeopardy violation. And that's because no manifest necessity existed uh, to, for the court's sua sponte ordering of a mistrial. And this is so for four main reasons. First, as the United States Supreme Court pointed out uh, in Arizona v. Washington, prosecutors are generally entitled to one and only one opportunity to require an accused to stand trial. In this case, the record shows that the prosecutor didn't know about the existence of this note that was late disclosed. Uh, the officer had it in his possession and apparently did not disclose it to the prosecutor, who in turn did not disclose it to the defense. Given that fact, the prosecutor apparently was ready, willing, and able to proceed with his prosecution of Mr. Dickinson at his first trial without that note. Yet despite that, the trial court ruled um, a mistrial based solely on the fact that the court found that note to be, in her words, crucial evidence, important evidence to the state's case. That is not manifest necessity. Uh, did the court also suggest that it had been, it was, there was a lot of confusion? Um, the court seemed to indicate that she was confused and thought the jurors would similarly be confused and to have just had this evidence come in um, without saying anything more about it would, would be confusing. How, how does that play into the analysis? I think there's two ways that plays into the analysis. And, and you are correct. The judge did, did make statements um, to that effect. Um, but the, the main issue is that, um, and, and this court noted it in, in uh, Jones v. Kiger, um, that when considering a mistrial, the trial judge, trial judge excuse me, must recognize that the defendant has a significant interest in deciding whether to take the case from a jury and that it is the defendant that retains primary control over when that happens. The defendant is the one that drives this train, and I think that the judge um, trumped the defendant's, Mr. Dickinson's, interest in keeping this case in front of this jury um, with her concern over confusion, as well as her concern over the importance of this evidence. Are, are there any circumstances in your mind where, uh, where a judge would be justified in uh, trumping, for lack of a better word, the uh, defense counsel's position? There are some, Your Honor, and that's when manifest necessity uh, is what, present. What examples would you, uh, would you offer? Uh, I mean, courts have recognized a truly deadlocked jury as something that constitutes manifest necessity so that a retrial doesn't violate double jeopardy. Um, there are cases that involve um, a military trial that uh, because of actions in the field, they had to cancel the trial. Um, if a judge became quite ill halfway through the trial, I believe that would constitute manifest necessity. Anything to do with like an evidentiary issue? No, I, most of the cases that discuss um, evidentiary issues 
um, and sp specifically State v. Aguilar discusses, um, uh, cites a list of, of cases from other jurisdictions that involve um, evidentiary issues where the state is not able to use certain evidence in this case for one reason or another. And in all those cases that reviewed that type of situation, none of the cases uh, courts found that manifest necessity exists when the state is unable to use a particular piece of evidence for, for one reason or another. In the, uh, in the Aguilar case, the, the, the court analyzes the obligation of the trial court to, uh, to make what they call an exacting inquiry before determining that manifest necessity exists. On, on this record, what's your position on whether the trial court conducted that exacting inquiry? Uh, it's our belief that the court in no way um, conducted that type of exacting um, uh, um, uh, met that standard. Um, the, the court was given one alternative from the defense counsel, which was preclusion of this particular piece of late disclosed evidence. Um, and I should note, uh, a side note, that the court did in fact find that there was a Rule 15 violation here and found that this late discover, uh, disclosure of this information was prejudicial to Mr. Dickinson. Um, and, and defense counsel requested the preclusion of this evidence. That is a, if the judge had done that, she would have been well within her um, discretion to have done so. Rule 15.7 specifically uh, anticipates such a, a um, remedy for, for late disclosed evidence. Well, did but, counsel actually move to strike this evidence? I, I didn't sense that, that they did because they didn't want to draw attention, any more attention to it. Well, I believe the specific request that the defense counsel made was to um, preclude the actual note um, and also to not in any way refer to it again. Um, such, like, again, such a remedy would have been with the, well within the, the judge's discretion she, had she chose to, to do that. On top of that, her reason for not <coughs> precluding the evidence um, was improper. She found that this particular piece of evidence that neither the defense and again, nor the prosecutor knew existed, um, she found it to be crucial, in her words, to the state's uh, case and very important, so she wouldn't preclude it. Um, on top of that, she sort of theoretically considered a continuance, um, but didn't really do any sort of investigation to find out if a continuance would be appropriate. In uh, the Aguilar case, one of the issues that the judge in that case expressed a concern with was uh, if the court continued th that trial, uh, it might be a problem to some of the jurors who may not, might not be able to make it for, the, for, for a later trial. Um, but that court specifically found that the trial judge should have polled the jurors to find out if they were, in fact, able to return. Similarly, in, in this case, the judge expressed some sort of theoretical concern about witnesses possibly not being able to um, return if she, she granted a continuance of the case, uh, but she never asked those witnesses whether or not they would be available. Um, I think that's akin to the issue in Aguilar where the, the, this court found that that just wasn't enough to determine whether or not some alternative other than mistrial was feasible. Finally, Your Honor, um, the judge didn't consider a limiting, limiting instruct, instruction in this case. Um, neither side requested it. But if you read the transcript, it's clear that there was virtually no time for any alternative um, remedies to be suggested to the court. Um, the court, when this issue first came up, there was an objection. It, the jury was, was removed from the room, and defense counsel requested that this case continue. Um, he specifically said, I don't want to ask for a mistrial, um, and he asked that the, that, that the trial continue with the particular evidence precluded. The judge, uh, I guess, took that under consideration, broke for the day, and when she returned, when the court uh, reconvened the next day, argument was heard again from the state and defendant um, attorney. The state argued that they should not only, should there be no sanction, that they should be allowed to use the evidence, the defense attorney asked again that it be precluded, and in the court's ruling, uh, denying that request for preclusion, she then ordered a mistrial. And there was virtually no moment when anyone could suggest any other alternative. But that, that's simply assuming one of the parties 
requested, assuming the defense requested a limiting instruction, there's really nothing that would suggest that the court would not have granted that. I'm not, I'm not sure that that necessarily pushes pushes me in one direction or the, uh, or the other. I, I guess the point of, of those examples was just that the court, in this case, didn't consider other alternatives. She, she, the, the, the trial judge jumped almost immediately to ordering a mistrial, um, despite the fact that defense counsel made it clear that he did not want to ask for one, that he was specifically wanted the, the trial to proceed um, just without, with the preclusion of this late disclosed evidence. Counsel, do you agree that the prosecutor <clears throat> also was opposed to dismissal of the case? There, I mean, during, during the colloquy that went on between the court and the T To be counsel. frank, I was a little confused about what the prosecutor was arguing. Um, what I got from his argument was that he, yes, wanted the case to go forward. Um, he was not asking for a mistrial either, but that he wanted the case to go forward and be allowed to use this note that was never disclosed to the defense. Well, I guess my ring was a bit different. I read it, maybe that was not, certainly not his first choice for it to be precluded, but I'll quote one part. It says, lastly, Your Honor, can the state go forward or can its case proceed? And then the prosecutor answers his own question. It can proceed forward with the exclusion of this evidence. It's not the state's first priority because all facts should go to the jury. But however, it is an option for the court. But that being said, so, I mean, if we were to reverse here, what, is that fair? I mean, I mean, the prosecutor was not advocating for this. Defense counsel was obviously not advocating for this at all, but it seems uh, a bit strange at best that we would reverse when the prosecutor was saying, we're, he we're ready, we're ready to move forward with this, and then the state would be penalized. Well, I, I don't think... The state's position on, on a case where uh, the judge sua sponte orders a mistrial is really irrelevant. Um, the issue is whether or not there was a manifest necessity for the mistrial. And if there's no manifest necessity, it doesn't really matter whether the state wanted to go forward or whether they were requesting a mistrial. Um, so long as it's, it's the defendant's double jeopardy rights that, that are at issue here. And fairness, to be quite frank, doesn't really come into the, into the picture. The, the, the double jeopardy clause is there specifically to limit the state from re-prosecuting people uh, in cases where a trial court orders a mistrial, sua sponte, and there's no manifest necessity. Our argument is that there was clearly no manifest necessity, and if, if um, fairness, again, isn't part of the equation under the jeopardy... Uh, I think fundamental error would be... Uh, the, the error is, is reversible regardless of what the state position the state's position was. C correct your honor um the in, if, if in the state argued uh if you dismiss this there will be a double jeopardy violation if there's a retrial and the state said under no circumstances do we want this to to be dismissed um i guess under under that theory it, it would still be a double jeopardy violation is your position or yes if the judge if the judge um over that that's statement from the from the prosecutor ordered a mistrial sua sponte yes the the issue would still be whether or not there was manifest necessity for that mistrial order um in 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 all of the cases state v aguilar um uh jones v kiger some of them are, aren't clear whether or not the, the prosecution uh objected or or not uh, um, regarding whether or not they wanted a mistrial, but the, judge, the courts in those cases never address that issue. It's, it's sort of an irrelevant point. Um, the issue they, is solely whether or not a manifest necessity existed for the judge's order, and it's our argument that it did not in this case. Um, specifically, as I said, um, the judge, the prosecutor had his one opportunity. He thought he was going to move forward with this case without this, this note. Um, so preclusion should have been the proper remedy here. Um, that's what the defense wanted, as well as apparently the prosecutor would have been okay with. Um, and, and one other issue I would note that this note, um, there cannot be manifest necessity for ordering a mistrial when the late disclosed evidence is otherwise inadmissible. And in this case, that note was at least three la la layers of hearsay and would have been inadmissible anyway under the hearsay rules. So the judge essentially orders a mistrial um, over a piece of late disclosed evidence that wasn't even admissible anyway. Um, 
And with that, I would like to reserve my time. If, if you could just briefly, though, address um, waiver. Um, is, is there an argument? Is there not an argument that uh, when the court says, "Well, I'm I'm going to uh, uh, I'm going to mistry this. If you want to file a motion to dismiss with prejudice, do it." And there's no uh, there's no motion that's filed. It does doesn't does that suggest that um, the defendant is in agreement that okay this is this is the best uh, best way to proceed I don't see a, a basis for arguing that this can't go forward uh, it does that factor into a waiver analysis I don't believe it does your honor um, for two reasons one specific to this case and one in general the general reason is because um, there there a double jeopardy uh, claim can be raised for the first time on appeal so the defense counsel, whether or not he, in this case, he did not file a motion to dismiss, um, wouldn't really play into the analysis. Uh, we can raise this issue for the first time on appeal. Uh, I agree with that, but I guess the the question goes to, it, it's a little bit a little bit dicey. I certainly can read the the transcripts the way you're reading them to say that my first choice is um, I want to go forward. I don't want to mistry this. Do not mistry it. Uh, but if 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 it's not that clear and you're you're kind of going back and forth. Um, well, maybe it's okay to mistry it, maybe not. On, on balance, I'd prefer this, but is there a, kind of an implicit consent when you then kind of acquiesce in what the court's doing and don't file a motion? It, it makes it look like you're you're agreeing that this is a viable alternative when you don't file a, a motion to dismiss with prejudice. Um, what I'd say to that question, Your Honor, is um, the – his acquiescence to the mistrial has to be overt. I mean, it can't be sort of not overt. Um, and in this case, I think he overtly said he does not want a mistrial. Um, in addition to that, regarding the, the filing of this motion to dismiss, at the time the judge suggested that the defense counsel file a motion to dismiss, we believe she was referring to a motion to dismiss for the for the Rule 15 violation, not under double jeopardy grounds, because at that point, the, the state had made no indication that they were going to retry Mr. Dickinson. It may have been assumed that they were, but they never said this on the record. And therefore, there would have been no double jeopardy violation until they, at least at the point where they made that clear that they intended to, to retry him. So at the time that the judge requested this motion to dismiss, I read that as a request uh, for sanctions under Rule 15, um, not uh, a double jeopardy argument, in which case the defense counsel wouldn't have waived in any way um, his argument regarding double jeopardy. And if I may uh, reserve my time, I would like to. Thank you. May it please the court, my name is Eliza Ibera and I represent the state in this matter. Uh, a, tr a second trial was manifestly necessary in this case because the jury had already heard David Scalia's testimony about the piece of the scrap of paper. Uh, uh, that the, the scrap of paper existed, that it confirmed that the bikes were the same, and this was prejudicial because it went to the heart of the defendant's defense that they weren't the same bike. So imagine being a juror on this panel. And imagine hearing this information just after defense counsel had argued that they weren't the same bike. Then imagine being told to disregard this testimony, the most probative evidence in the case. Or imagine not being told to disregard this evidence and when I say evidence, I'm talking, to, talking about David Scalia's testimony about the existence of the scrap of paper, not the scrap of paper. Uh, but imagine that nobody ever mentioned it again, and, and the trial continued, and you, you heard oral ar uh, closing arguments, and the state never mentioned it, the defense never mentioned it, and you're sitting here as a juror wondering, well, what about this scrap of paper? I thought that was the most prejudicial, the, the most probative evidence in the entire case, and and it's, it's unfathomable to me about why nobody's mentioning this evidence. Um, that would have been extremely confusing. It would have been completely baffling and perplexing. But wouldn't, wouldn't that inure to the, uh, more to the state's benefit? If the, the evidence came in and there was some reference that the, these identific 
identification numbers were written down. Um, it seems like any confusion inures to the state's benefit. And if the defendant makes the choice, I'd rather go forward with some confusion than retry this two months down the road with, uh, with a chance for the state to develop. And I'm, I'm assuming the accuracy of the note and if, if we go to trial, I'm the defense attorney, I'm assuming that it's, it's an accurate uh, recording and they're just gonna hammer my client. I'd rather go forward with the confusion. Why isn't it the defendant's right to say, I know it's kind of confusing and that's probably gonna help the state in, there's been a reference to some numbers. Um, why, why doesn't the defendant get to make that choice? Well, because a, a jury trial is a search for truth and the, the judge has an, a responsibility to administer justice. But and the judge agree, has, oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, what if, if there had been no reference to it and the prosecutor just said, we've just discovered this note and we want to introduce it? Oh, I, I, mean, I, I would say that uh, double jeopardy was violated in that case because the court could have just precluded the note and the jury oh, would that, never have heard of it. But that goes to my, the, the okay. question of if it's search for truth and that information is out there, um, oh. we're, we're saying we understand that it's a search for the truth, but everybody's on board that that's a, a, an appropriate remedy for a late disclosure. Um, and so if that's the case and if the defendant's entitled to go forward, even though there's a truthful item that's not going to be presented, why is he entitled to go forward when something bad has come out, um, maybe a little bit confusing, but it's some information that suggests that this bike is the same one that was, that was stolen? Uh, well, uh, I'd like to answer that question by referring to Arizona versus Washington, where the state said there's a spectrum of scrutiny when you're analyzing abuse of discretion. On one end is where there's a, a piece of evidence for the prosecution that wasn't available, and that deserves the strictest level of scrutiny. On the other level, on the other end of the spectrum, you have a situation where the jury's deadlocked through no fault of anybody. It's it's just deadlocked, and on that end of the spectrum, the court deserves the highest level of deference. And the reason why this end of the spectrum deserves so much more uh, scrutiny is because the whole point of the double jeopardy clause is to not permit the state to keep retrying the defendant and making its case better and better and better through trial and error. Uh, the, so. In this case, if the jury had not heard any mention of the scrap of paper, the court could have reasonably just precluded the scrap of paper and moved on with trial, and that could have been the sanction that the court chose. But since the, the jury had already heard the mention of the scrap of paper, uh, the court couldn't do that. Precluding the scrap of paper and just forbidding either party from mentioning it again, would have, it would have done nothing to alleviate the confusion. But it, isn't that speculative, though? Do we? Wouldn't, couldn't that have been addressed if the jurors um, expressed some confusion down the road and said we're deadlocked or we're confused? And if they came back with a question that said we don't, somebody mentioned this note and now we haven't heard anything about it, what do we do with that? It seems like that would be a different issue than, than where we are here where maybe, I'm, I'm not sure that it necessarily would have been been all that confusing to the jury to just go forward. Maybe the judge was more confused than the than the jurors were. Well, um, the trial court was actually in the best position to see the jurors' confusion. Um, and uh, Arizona versus Washington talks about that. It says um, the judge is the uh, is the judge mo the trial judge is the most familiar with the evidence and background of trial. He's listened to the tone of the argument, or in this case, I would say he's listened to David's testimony about the scrap of paper as it was delivered and has observed the apparent reaction of the jurors. In short, he is far more conversant with the factors relevant to the de this determination than any reviewing court can be. And uh, I would submit that it's exactly the same in this case. The trial court was there. The trial court saw the juror's confusion. Uh, perhaps the court could have moved forward and then uh, declared a mistrial after the jurors um, expressed their confusion by asking a question about this scrap of paper. But what was the court supposed to answer if they did ask that question? The court couldn't lie and say, well, that really there's no scrap of paper. The court could, have, at the most, the, the court could have done what would have just been to say, well, please don't consider the scrap of paper. But it couldn't strike David's testimony because the defense counsel had already tied its hands by saying, we don't want you to strike this testimony because it'll draw more attention to the error.
Couldn't they have changed their changed their mind at that point if, if something had come up? Uh, we're ordering you not to consider any evidence relating to a slip of paper. Would, would that have been an improper instruction at that point? The trial court found that that would not uh, feasibly, that would not be a feasible alternative. What the trial court stated was that uh, given the testimony from Mr. Scalia yesterday, I believe that if this evidence were to be precluded or admitted, either way, at this point, that is going to result in a lot of confusion. And that's a factual finding that's entitled to deference on appeal. Could I, could I, sorry. No. I was just going to ask, have you come across any cases that, that specifically address jury confusion where the where court is sua sponte ordered mis, a mistrial? Uh, yes, I have. I would say that the most, uh, the best case that is the most similar to this case is actually People versus Bagley, and it's an Illinois case that uh, Aguilar cites. In People versus Bagular, uh, People versus Bagley, um, there was, the defendant was <coughs> charged with a DUI, and there the police had interviewed him shortly after this, and there was a videotaped interaction between the defendant and the police. Well, the video went missing. Um, one of the police officers had taken it to the hearing about whether his license would be revoked. So when the, the prosecutor searched for the evidence, it wasn't in the evidence locker. But right, right after the jurors were sworn, uh, the prosecutor met with the police officer and discovered, oh, wait, actually, we have this videotape. And uh, the, the court said uh, that, uh, and defense counsel, very similarly to in this case, said, that's not fair. You can't use this defense, t this videotape, because uh, the court had already heard briefing on this matter and was going to give a Willis, basically a Willis instruction uh, based on the missing videotape. And the defense counsel said, that throws a wrench into our whole defense strategy. Very similar to the case here where the defendant said uh, it was a material important fact in the case uh, that our whole defense was that it wasn't the same bike. It was a clear disclosure violation. And uh, there was extreme legal prejudice. Uh, and also the court said that this went to the heart of the case. It was absolutely vital to the defense case. It wasn't disclosed until yesterday. So this is a very similar situation. And, and are you saying in, in Bagley the defense did not request a mistrial? Uh, in, the ba in Bagley, I believe the court, so Esponte declared the mistrial. Uh, let me just verify. And we, we can um, look. At, you don't know whether it was over the defense objection or... Um, the court did sua sponte declare a mistrial. Um, the court said we could have precluded this evidence, but defense counsel said it went to the heart of the defense strategy. So that confusion and the un inherent unfairness of making the defendant change his strategy just as the jury was being seated is why the court decided that a, a trial, uh, that a mistrial was manifestly necessary, and that was affirmed on appeal. And I'd like to contrast that case with another case that Aguilar cites, because uh, when Aguilar gives a list of the types of situations where no manifest necessity is present, it says one of the situations it lists is where new evidence dis is discovered after the jury has been sworn. And initially, that sounds very damaging to our case. It's like, because here, new evidence was discovered after the jur jury was sworn. But the case that they cite for that premise is uh, Parche versus Bird, which is a Florida case. And, f and that Florida case is completely distinguishable from the case at present that we have here. Um, and I'd like to also point out, before I get into the facts of that case, that in U.S. versus Jorn, the United States Supreme Court talked about how analyzing the facts of each case is super important in this area because it's so fact-specific. They, they specifically rejected the idea that you should just have categories of cases that are always automatically decided the same way. Uh, so that's U U.S. versus Jorn, 400 U.S. 470. Okay, so now getting into the, the facts of Parche versus Bird, which is a Florida case. Um, in that case, let's see. Okay, sorry, excuse me. Um, in that case, uh, a police officer officer was testifying and all of a sudden it became apparent that there was a case agent who was on the case who had never been disclosed. Who, and, and this case agent had written reports about the case and so the court said, well wait a second, here's this massive disclosure violation, what do we do? And the court, um, 
Let's see, I think the court sui sponte declared a mistrial in this case as well. But the important thing is that uh, the, on appeal, the, the appellate court said, well, what you could have just done is preclude the report. You could have just uh, said you can't mention this case agent. And what was important is that the jury had never heard a, anything that went to the heart of the case that was um, not remediable. All they had heard is that there is this case agent, but that didn't go to any element in the case the way that here, the fact that they were the same bike went uh, directly to the most contested issue in the case. So the court could have just precluded, it, uh, precluded the report uh, or had a continuance, and they could have just gone on. And I'd, I'd like but to- so you're, But oh. your, your argument then is essentially that because this came out, it, it, was, it was confusing, and so there was nothing more else that could be done other than to say um, we, we have to mistry it because this, this is going to be so harmful to the defendant. But that, that kind of goes to my initial question of why doesn't the defendant get to make that choice? If he doesn't think it's that harmful to him um, or that it's less harmful than waiting and letting everybody develop the evidence and having it come out that uh, this note was in fact accurate and He's just dead to right on the um, on the evidence. Why isn't it? Why doesn't the defendant get to make that choice? Sure, that's a, that's an important aspect of the analysis. And in Dinitz, the U.S. Supreme Court case, um, which is uh, the the Dinitz court talked about how important it was to let the defendant um, have input into that decision, and that's the case that Jones versus Kiger is relying on when they say that. But uh, what I would like to point out is that Dinitz was uh, a case where the defendant clearly requested the mistrial. That was, it was sort of an unusual case. Uh, the defense, the defendant had two lawyers. But isn't, isn't that very different? That, that's the whole point, though. If the defendant requests it, then he's, he doesn't have standing to raise any, he can't raise any, any kind of an argument that it was improperly mistried if he, if he requests it. Exactly. So if you find that the defendant consented to the mistrial, then you would analyze whether or not uh, he had the right to control his, his destiny. If you find that, no, he did not consent, then the next step is to analyze whether a manifest necessity was present. And then you go to uh, Arizona versus Washington, which emphasizes how much the court should defer to the trial court's discretion, especially where it's really nobody's fault. Um, but my fault. hang up is the okay. only the only possible prejudice in going forward, well, it seems to me that there's been some damaging evidence that came out uh, that's not helpful to the defendant. And so if you're saying it's manifest necessity, um, the state was prepared to go forward without that evidence. And if we had excluded the evidence altogether, everybody's on board that it's, it's okay, we're going to go forward even though that evidence isn't there. So it wasn't manifestly necessary to the state's case to have that evidence introduced in the first place. So if it came in and it helped the state a little bit, but the defendant said, on balance, I'd rather just go forward, you, you'd clearly be on board if the defendant says, I want to go forward and exclude the evidence that's never been mentioned. Um, that's the defendant's right to say, I just want to go forward don't mention it at all. It, it, it's come in and it's hurt me. I'm, I'm having a hard time understanding why it's, it's not okay for the defendant or why it's not the defendant's choice at that point. If he's the only one that's been hurt, why is it manifestly necessary to, uh, to, to mistry the case at that point? Uh, well, under Arizona versus question. Washington, at the end of the day, it's the trial court that gets to decide whether it's manifestly necessary or not. And here, the defense said, well, wait, we think we just want to go forward. I mean, and sorry to interrupt, but if, okay. if let, let's say the state had come out and said, uh, under no circumstances do we want this mistried, there would be a double jeopardy bar to retrying him. And defense counsel says, under no circumstances do I want this mistried. Um, I'm going to file a motion to dismiss with prejudice immediately. Both sides agree that there's a double jeopardy violation, and the state says um, this evidence was never critical to our case. We were prepared to go forward without it. The trial court nevertheless uh, mistries the case. Um, it, are, do we defer to the, the trial court's assessment of this was going to be confusing and um, so we have to uphold a mistrial, under, or we have to say that didn't result in a double jeopardy 
Yes, violation. you do, because the, the court was the disinterested third party that could observe the juror's confusion, and the court was the one that, regardless of whether it benefited the state's case or the defendant's case, thought that this confusion was irreme irremediable because it couldn't offer a corrective instruction. Oh, excuse Can me. It, what about, I, sorry to interrupt, but wouldn't a reasonable alternative been to for the court to sui sponte strike, strike the testimony? about the slip of paper? Uh, well, the court considered that. It, it heard arguments and gave the parties overnight to prepare them. But the court, but the defense uh, said, I don't want you to do that because no, but, that but, will draw more attention to it. Go right, but oh, and, the and court certainly, went over the wishes on a, on a more, much more drastic remedy of, of dismissal. So why couldn't the court do something much smaller and say, counsel, I'm going to disagree with you. I'm going to strike that testimony because I think it would lead to undue, uh, undue pre prejudice and confusion to the jury. That seems like, I guess what I'm struggling with is, is in Aguilera, Aguilera it talks about quite a, a lot of emphasis on re what are all the reasonable alternatives that should have been explored. And I'm struggling to find those in this record. I guess. Certainly. No, that's a, that's a very important question. Um, and that's exactly what this court needs to do when it's analyzing whether manifest necessity exists. Um, the reason why the court couldn't have done that is if it uh, even, I mean, certainly the court could have just ignored the defense counsel's wishes and, and done it anyway, but the court knew that if it did that, it would draw even more attention to this scrap of paper, which was unfairly disclosed to the defendant in the middle of trial. Uh, one huge difference between this case and Aguilar is that in Aguilar, the jury never heard about this ballistics report that the prosecutor wanted to get in that wasn't disclosed uh, because it, uh, the, just to refresh the facts on Aguilar, uh, there was a ballistics report that the prosecutor had requested that he didn't realize had been prepared before trial started. So after trial started, uh, the prosecutor tried to, wanted to get it admitted, and uh, the, the court said, okay, well, we're going to declare a mistrial because this is a critical piece of evidence. Well, the, the problem that the trial court fell into was that is exactly the situation that Arizona versus Washington forbids. It's on the spectrum of if you find this crucial piece of uh, prosecutorial evidence, that's not a good reason to declare a mistrial because the prosecutor should have been ready, willing, and able to present the, the case uh, at the time that it was tried. Um, so, and, and the, the reviewing court said, I think what you should have done is just uh, preclude this evidence. But they couldn't have done that here because of the inevitable jury confusion regarding David's testimony. And if David hadn't testified about it, I would agree that this should have been a, a double jeopardy violation. But he did, and at that point, the bell couldn't be unrung. Uh, the confusion couldn't be unrung, is how the, the trial court put it. And the cat was out of the bag. If the court has no further questions, I would submit on the briefs. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the government mentioned this speculative confusion that the jury may or may not have been uh, struggling with, but that just begs the question. The issue here is who's in control when there's a trial error about whether or not to keep this jury and proceed with trial or whether to call for a mistrial, and that's the defendant. And in this case, Mr. Dickinson's attorney was clear that he did not want to ask for a, a mistrial, that he wanted to move forward with this jury, and he simply asked that the evidence be precluded. The state, or the government today conceded that if, mis, if, if the testimony had not come in at all, then this would be double jeopardy, that they could have just precluded the note, and if they ordered a mistrial instead, that would be double jeopardy. The facts here are no different than that. All that happened was one statement was made um, arguably prejudicial to the defendant. And again, that's the issue. The defendant can, um, is in, it drives this train. The defendant in this case said he wants to move forward with trial despite the fact that there may have been prejudicial testimony elicited during his trial. And therefore, no manifest necessity existed for this mistrial. If it's somehow clear that the defense attorney is just uh, completely missed the boat and should have uh, should not have acquiesced or should have done something different. Can the court go over the defendant's wishes in that circumstance 
and that's it's not a very good question but uh, are there any circumstances where it, the court can look and say look I know the defense attorney is saying that this he would rather go forward but I can't see any circumstances under which this could possibly work for him uh, there are some cases that discuss um, a manifest necessity uh, or, or at least the the a retrial not violating double jeopardy when the reason for the mistrial um, was for the sole benefit of the defendant. Um, that's a very strict standard, um, and it can't be some sort of hypothetical benefit to the defendant. But However, would that be the case if, if, if you had mistried this and then said in the next case we're not going to admit that, that evidence that came in? Would, would that be an example of... Uh, because it was, it's kind of hard, hard to argue that it's late disclosed when you have a, a new trial. But if, if they had said this evidence came in, um, it should not have come in. When we retry this the next time, that evidence will not come in. Under those circumstances, would that be an instance maybe where the, the judge's views should trump that of the defense attorney? I don't think so in that case, Your Honor. The cases that discuss the sole benefit of the defendant um, are not supposed to look um, down the road at what may or may not occur. They're sort of supposed to look at what occurred at the initial trial um, and to determine whether or not it was for the sole benefit of the defendant. In this case, though, we don't, we're not even there because the, the, the trial court clearly was doing this for the sole benefit of the prosecution. She said that this evidence is crucial to the state's case, and therefore I can't preclude it. And therefore, I'm going to call, uh, order a mistrial. I think that's um, the exact opposite of, of what you're describing. Um, and finally, Your Honor, uh, regarding strict scrutiny, strict scrutiny protects Mr. Dickinson's right to, do, uh, to double jeopardy. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you both for your argument. It's a very interesting case. Uh, we will take this matter under advisement and issue a decision in due course. That we're adjourned.